Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we're really thrilled that you could join us today for On Building Vibrant Communities of Belonging. My name is Alex Elliott, and I am the Senior Manager for Events and Engagement for the Public Programs Department of California Institute of Integral Studies, which, if you don't know, is a nonprofit university located in San Francisco. As many of us are descendants of settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those who were forcefully brought to this continent, we, CIIS Public Programs, must recognize and never forget that our university's building in San Francisco occupies traditional, unceded Ramatush Ohlone lands. If you are interested in learning more about Native lands, languages, and territories where you live, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. Before we get started tonight, I have a couple of general tips and troubleshooting items to go over. Uh, we are going to be having a live Q&A after the conversation tonight. So if you are watching live, uh, you can submit your questions at any time using our anonymous web form, which is linked in the event description just below this video. Our presenters are going to select questions that were submitted uh, via that form after their talk, and we'll try to get through as many as we have time for. We do have automatically generated captions enabled for this event, and you can toggle those on and off using the closed captioning button right in YouTube. If you are having any issues with your audio or video, we always suggest that you first reload the page. And then if you're still having issues, you can adjust your video settings right within YouTube and it can help to reduce your video quality. Now, let me first introduce our presenters, Shoshana and Lisa, and then we will get right to their conversation. Shoshana Simons is a professor and former program chair of CIIS's MA in Counseling Psychology Expressive Arts Concentration and interim chair of the Community Mental Health Concentration. Shoshana has 35 plus years of experience in community building with peoples across dimensions of difference and similarity in many settings, including with children and adults in the fields of play, education, anti-racism, counseling psychology, organizational development, and community work. Shoshana has worked as a therapist in the UK and USA and has taught in the fields of counseling psychology and intercultural relations at Goddard College, University of Vermont, and Lesley University. Shoshana holds an MA degree in sociology and social policy from London Metropolitan University, an MA degree in human development, and a PhD in human and organizational systems from the Fielding Graduate Institute. She's a graduate of the Omega Transpersonal Drama Therapy Program in Boston and Wisdom of the Whole Coaching Academy. Lisa Kenton is a psychologist with over three decades experience as a clinician, educator, and speaker. She is the author of An Intentional Life, Five Foundations of Authenticity and Purpose. Dr. Kenton has published scientific articles on the development of conscious awareness, biological correlates of depression and anxiety, and identifying emotional difficulties in children. She believes that creating vibrant communities is the path forward through the unprecedented social, psychological, and existential crises we face. And now it is my absolute pleasure to turn it over to Shoshana and Lisa. Welcome, Lisa. Welcome. Thank you, Shoshana. It's good to be here. And it's a strange thing because here we are, but we're not really here. And I'm wondering, first of all, have you ever been into the building at CIS in San Francisco? Never, but I am curious. I, have, um, I haven't been to San Francisco in over 10 years. Wow. Yeah. Well, next time you're here, I really want to welcome you into the building. And um, your book is about the practice of belonging and what is so rich. One of the things that was really rich for me in reading it is the, is the importance of place. Um, that that comes through as an element of belonging. So just being aware that we're meeting in this sort of outside of place and time um, setting and just wanting to welcome you in. Thank you. So in our 
and we had some an opportunity to talk in advance last week which was really a joy and we kept getting started and having to hold back on diving right in so this is our chance to like dive right on in so I just want to open the space for you to begin by sharing um, sharing about your book. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll just start by giving you a background of how the book called out to be written. Um, I had just launched my other book, so I was kind of gearing up to put energy behind that. Um, and I Remind us of your other books so we can see how they belong together. For sure. The other one is An Intentional Life. And it really kind of, what I brought to it was my, my work as a clinician and also 30 years of meditating. And it was really practices and living with intention. And that felt complete. So it took me by surprise. Normally, I wouldn't be saying that I had a dream to write a book on community, or I wouldn't be so public about it, but I think it's very much related. Um, I didn't understand why then I, I wasn't ready to start writing another book, and I wouldn't have particularly thought it was me that would have written it. Um, it's not that I don't have communities, but I always, I have friends who live in, you know, they have intentional, they live in intentional communities, or they really gather as community intentionally. Um, I saw myself perhaps as more someone who has really intimate one on one relationships. So I did what I typically do is I immersed myself in reading about community. And when I did, themes of belonging came up frequently. And surprisingly, maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but I found that there was relatively little in the psychological literature on belonging. And why that surprised me is how much do we have on depression, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. And belonging or a crisis of belonging is so related to these problems that we see. So so there was a couple of lines and then one is seeing a theme on belonging that came up again and again. I reached out to a community that I actually went to for a week during spring break 30 years before called Larsh Community. Um, I went to a Jesuit university and they gave us, you know, we had no money. So they gave us a few bucks and a car to go be of service. And so I went to some Erie, Pennsylvania to ostensibly you know, be of service. And very quickly um, realized that they were just welcome, welcoming us to community and learning about celebrating. And it's basically people living in homes with identified cognitive disabilities and people without identified disabilities. And what really struck me was, you know, after a long weekend, or it might have been four or five days, I was ready to come home. I thought I had my fill, and it stayed with me. And maybe you'll see themes in the book, but you, it kind of defies how memory tracks are laid down. There's these quiet moments that I wouldn't particularly think of sharing with you, but they stayed with me 30 years later. And to me, as I began to explore more about community, that is community. It's mm. these quiet moments of connection. Mm. They make an indelible print. Mm. You know, they're not these like fabulous moments, although there are those too, you know. When I'm looking away, it's because I'm writing down things that are striking me about what you're saying. <laughs> and just one other piece that came into my mind is I, you know, I taught for a bunch of years, but my last years um, in New York, I moved to the Pacific Northwest about three years ago, were as a, primarily as a clinician in private practice. Mm -hmm. And there were these themes that maybe weren't foreground with my clients. Um, and it was a longing for something greater, but it came, it, it wasn't always expressed like that. It was maybe someone who left the Catholic church, you know, a gazillion years ago and his daughter was in a choir. So he ended up going and there were themes of community 
And even though he wouldn't consider himself religious, he talked about how this moved him. Mm. And another person talked about wanting to be closer to his son. So he became a boy scout. What do you call that? Uh, the, you know, the, the men that are the leaders of boy scouts, right? And he talked about, he found community and it almost made him weep that he didn't even know it was a longing. Wow. So there were just themes like that, that I started to then look back over uh -huh. the years and they increased over time. Okay. Yeah. I immediately got curious about, and this is always the choice points in, in an interview like this, and there's so much richness here, but in what, it, what was it about this, this time in all your years as a clinician that um, sparked the connection in this time? <clears throat> what was it about this particular time in our, in our, in the challenges that our communities are facing that maybe made this land in a different way, because it sounds like, as you said, quiet moments of connection that have been there over and over again in the background. Is there something about these, these years that we've been through as communities that, um, that, that brought this up, brought this more out into the light, into the, into the surface? Yeah. You know, I would guess yes, but I think, I, like everyone else, have felt the pain of the increasing discord between people. And I, as a professional, as you know, with tremendous appreciation and faith in the process of psychotherapy, as an individual, was beginning to really grapple with, you know, this healing that happens behind closed doors mm -hmm. is not going to be enough, you know. Right. It's, it's the healing that we need in our communities. Of right. course, we need therapy. But even if everybody had a wonderful therapist, it's not going to address what we need in our communities. Right. That kind of intimacy. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, that really, that really makes so much sense. So um, can I just say one more piece about that? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that we as clinicians, aren't any, I certainly wasn't trained, aren't any more skilled at community building. Um, I think one of the, I wanna go back and I think we have this in our, whether it's our cells, our DNA, it's just, we haven't been practicing it. And that's where I think the longing is, which is different from a desire. We have these desires in the world and we're busy, but the slowing down, the stepping back, and learning to connect to each other in communal ways yeah. is really our true nature from my perspective now. I wouldn't have said that perhaps five years ago. Okay, so th this makes me curious um, as, you're, as you're talking about your own background as, as a clinician, as a therapist, a working therapist for, for three decades um, and having a lot of folks in your life who do live in intentional communities and sort of really, holding that space too, and then becoming increasingly um, aware of the call to want to, to um, know more about that, this crisis of belonging. I'm wondering about who your, who your, whether you had a sense of a primary audience when you were writing this um, and coming out of your, your own background as a clinical psychologist, was were were, th were clinicians foremost in your mind? Was it more general than that? It was more general than that, it, but it's funny because you know your publisher always wants to know who's your audience, and I'm like bloody everybody. Right. I'm not saying the book I wrote, but everybody yeah. needs. I almost wondered if clinicians might even be a little resistant to it. Yeah. No, um, because it's an idea of healing and gathering in ways especially because where I come from, you know, we're clinicians in New York City. So finding places to gather has, have mm -hmm. you know, unique challenges, just the cost of everything everywhere, but particularly mm -hmm. in cities, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and as I began, to, I started to just have conversations with people about community. And one of the most remarkable things is that virtually no one said no to me. 
because everybody wants to talk about community, even people who really focused on it much more than I did in their day to day life, which, by the way, I'm a, I'm a convert now. Um, like we got to we talked a few minutes last week. Once we start talking about community, we're off to the races. It's because it just touches on just natural ways of relating that we know in our hearts we need more of. Right. Yeah. So if you don't mind, I'd like, along with this, I, I had so many curiosities and there's so many questions I would love to ask you, but just to get us going, you use the word vibrant communities, the practice of belonging, six lessons from vibrant communities to combat loneliness, foster diversity and cultivate cult, uh, caring relationships. And that word vibrant really stood out for me. Um, and I wondered, was, was community vibrance an outcome of what you learned from meeting all these amazing folks and learning about what they were doing? Or did you go into this project seeking markers for, for it? Was it something that you learned through the doing of it? I, I learned through the doing of it. And someone else had asked me, how do you know that it's the vibrant community? Yeah. And it's not the most scientific way to just say, well, <laughs> make a place, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a place where you'd wanna show up and not just me, other people. Now, there are a number of people that gathered in living rooms that had a vibrancy about it, but wouldn't have made its way to the book necessarily. Okay. And I don't necessarily know why either. Yeah. You know, I, and I want to talk just a moment on what a why what a crisis of belonging looks like too. But um, the, what was wonderful is oftentimes I'd be having these great conversations, and even people who were familiar with community would say, "Well, tell me your communities," and it's kind of like asking you to define love. Like you'll go blank, and <laughs> you might. We know it, but it's hard to encompass it. But often at the very end of conversations, they would say, mm, there's this place in Austin you really should see. Or there's this concerts in Columbus, Ohio. So I'd get on a plane and I'd go to Columbus, Ohio. And it was almost like these last moment drops, you know, that ended up in the book. Ah, oh, so is that your, was that your method for how you came to identify and go to all these different places? Yeah. Yeah. So can you take us into that? Take yeah. us into that. I'm going to, um, can I spend two minutes on belonging to set yes. why? Okay. Absolutely. Please do. So even though there's kind of a paucity of studies, um, relatively speaking, there's data on belonging in the educational literature. And they show that a number of studies show that the number one variable that showed how younger children would do later in school, how well high school students would do in high school, and how well high school students would do when they got out was whether they felt like they had a social home, whether they felt like they belonged. Mm -hmm. Of all the money that we spend, that's the number one factor. And so I thought, wow, how would, if we really believe that to be true, how would we how would we teach differently? How would we take it seriously? So that's one piece. Um, an epidemiological study of like 70, I think 70 smaller studies, but over 300,000 sample size. It was, it was looking at um, factors that pre uh, predicted health, good health, mental and physical health, found that people who felt like they had a sense of belonging, it positively correlated with health, the equivalent of quitting smoking, physical exercise and a healthy diet combined, combined. That's like extraordinary, you know? And then the other piece of data looked at a, a 2018 survey. So this was pre-COVID. So you can imagine it's only exacerbated now of um, nearly half of the 20,000 respondents said that they felt lonely. Mm. Wow. And if that's correlated with depression and poor health outcomes, and they and nearly half said they didn't have meaningful interactions on most days, that's a crisis. That's a crisis. So that's so the whole premise of the book, and then we'll talk about the qualities of vibrancy, are 
the, the primary incubator or platform for healthy belonging are vibrant communities, not any community, but vibrant communities where we can be authentic. What do you mean by authentic? Where we can be who we are, all that we are. Um, it doesn't mean that everybody's not, some people aren't going to not appreciate us, you know, that, that happens in communities too. But to think about the qualities where people felt like they belong, like communities of faith, right? Many times people felt like they couldn't be authentically who they were. Certainly people who, who were gay or queer or, you know, or even in communities where they felt like um, it was a threat if we voiced our differences. Even, even if they didn't vilify people for doing so, mm -hmm. they kind of wanted to keep the peace. So in many communities, even where there was a sense of belonging, we didn't learn the skills of surfacing our differences, which really is one of the things that makes communities vibrant, you know? So I think this is like a, a nice opening into you talking about those key traits that you came, that you, you identified. Could I read them just so I can be fairly yeah, concise? Why not? Okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So basically, I just had hundreds of conversations. And after about a year and a half, I started to just think about what, what are some of these themes that are happening again and again? So I'll just read three pages, three and a half. When I reflected upon the conversations and experiences I had with these communities, six qualities stood out that distinguished them from other types of groups and gatherings. And then these six qualities are the focus of the book. The first quality is an explicit commitment to care for each other, which is a universal attribute among all vibrant communities. I said I wasn't gonna have an aside, but I am. Many times we get together and we'll, we'll care for each other because we're caring human beings. We wanna save the planet. We wanna educate, we, whatever the purpose of getting together, but we don't make it explicit from the get-go that these relationships are primary along with making these gadgets, educating people, saving the planet, worshiping together, okay? Um, this The commitment of care is uh, nurtures a sense of belonging, which is a fundamental human need. This quality may seem obvious, but it's not explicit in most established groups and social gatherings, nor is it a given in personal relationships. As with all six qualities, a commitment to care is a verb and not a noun, an active practice that is reflected in our perceptions, thoughts, choices, and actions. Now, these other five qualities are valued in all vibrant communities and are practiced to some degree. I found that each community often embodied two or three of the qualities in unique and powerful ways. The second quality of vibrant community is acceptance, valuing people for, for, for who they are, all that they are, which is essential for fostering authenticity. When we are accepted, we don't have to hide aspects of ourselves, including things that embarrass us or that we experience as broken. Chapter three introduces you to a community that practices radical acceptance and the members most skilled at community building have themselves known the pain of rejection. The third quality is diversity, valuing it and recognizing that it strengthens the community. Although most vibrant communities welcome diversity and aspire to greater inclusion, they can have difficulty making it a reality. A diverse community cannot happen without making it an explicit priority of the entire group. This is especially true in a well-established community where it's more difficult to make the kinds of changes needed for greater inclusion. The fourth quality is that vibrant communities have skillful ways to handle their differences that allow them to move beyond conflict toward understanding. Sometimes communities need the help of facilitators to structure the dialogue in ways that help build trust so they can hold conversations around difficult topics. Chapter five offers a model of how groups with a history of conflict 
shape their dialogues in order to facilitate solutions that create the possibility for future healing and reconciliation. The fifth quality in vibrant communities is the high value placed on celebration and ritual. Alongside sharing the mundane details of day-to-day -day life, these communities intentionally create opportunities for meaningful bonding and having fun. Ceremony and ritual are meaningful only because they take place within the context of caring relationships. And the sixth quality is the gift of hospitality, which is the ancient art of welcoming guests. This attribute runs counter to the premium that our consumerist culture places on exclusivity. Vibrant communities put effort into finding creative ways for people outside their membership to meaningfully participate in the experience of community. Um, we don't need tremendous resources or large numbers of people joining us to create community that's a positive force for change, both in our personal lives and in the world. And just one more point, instead of finding the, the kind of community that we imagine ourselves belonging to, the better approach is to start building community right now in small, meaningful ways. Toward that end, an important question to reflect upon is, how do I bring the qualities of vibrant community into all of my relationships, into all areas of my life? Beautiful. As you're speaking, I'm thinking um, you've just inside these inside these six key traits, there are so many stories. Yes. What you've done is you, you've distilled them into these six traits. But in reading the book, what you're doing is really bringing that vibrancy to life. And I felt like I got to know some of these folks that you were talking to. And, and I, it, it was so much also about the environment that they, to go back to what I opened with, the opening question around, you know, welcoming into our space, the way that you were welcomed in, the kind of we, the sense of, of, of we being part of something greater that, that you evoked in your writing. And I'm wondering if you can bring us a little bit into the stories so I know when we spoke in advance, you talked, you said, oh, yeah, Harmony Project, that 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 really stood, you know, that if there was one that you wanted to, like, maybe open up a little bit more, I'm wondering if that's something you would like to talk about more specifically. For sure. The storyteller, let the storyteller come out uh, as you've done in your book. And the Harmony Project is gathering around song, right? And think about how we gather in our communities around food, around music. And it's after meeting community that I thought, why, you know, why do I wait to go to a concert to be part of music? It's like, how can we bring music to bring us together? So the Harmony Project, um, I was talking to a woman who worked for the Obama administration on, you know, trying to solve the crisis of homelessness. I forgot what her title was. And at the very end, as I always do, I, I asked her, "Can you? is there a community I should meet or know? And she said, oh, yes, there's in my hometown of Columbus, Ohio, there is this amazing choir that meets twice a year for these incredible concerts, and you don't even have to audition. Um, the only thing you need to do is to, to serve. And there's a concert coming up next month. I think you should see it. And she, she said, we bring our families. And so I went to Columbus, Ohio to see this remarkable choir. In a short period of time, what started out as, you know, like a mailer asking people to show up who want to be in a choir and a hundred people showed up. Within a few years time, and I'll give you a little more background in a moment, um, the only place that they can fit now for their winter concert is the nationwide arena that seats like 25,000 people. Oh. So there's a 500 member choir and there's like 500 or a thousand people on the waiting list. They are from nearly every zip code in Columbus, Ohio. Now Columbus, Ohio is an up and coming city. And like many aff relatively affluent cities um, like New York City, it's very diverse but incredibly segregated. And so there are people that meet from every zip code. They differ along every dimension. And I'll tell you a little more of the interesting story of, kind of, you know, you might have a judge singing next to someone who had been incarcerated. 
Um, and when you go to a harmony concert, so I flew there and I was by myself and people started welcoming me. Is this your first concert? So right away, it just inspired connection. And people from, there's smaller choirs and people from the community that would come and sing with them. And what was really remarkable is they would have people from the Harmony Choir come out and sing, you know, solos. And then when they were finished, I've never seen a choir have such a fabulous time. They were giving each other high fives. And there was such a sense that there is no barrier between us for that night, this connection. And what's wonderful is they also show uh, on huge screens in the background, um, they show service projects. So they work neighborhood by neighborhood. They work with com the actual communities to make a park, to paint murals. And in doing so, they build connections with established community members. They don't just go in saying kind of, we're here to save your neighborhood. And so connections are built. Another way that they're very intentional about community is let's say we're singing in the choir, you and I know each other. And then we go to do our service a few times a year. You and I don't do service next to each other. They intentionally place me next to people from the choir that I otherwise wouldn't meet. So we might be painting curbs, starting out with, you know, how we got there. And before we know our differences, we share what we have in common. And right from the get-go, a friendship starts to develop. So harmony really highlights that if we lift our voices in song, it's one way to build community, but also working side by side. This is a theme I found. It's, it's not just fun, it's people who show up for each other in the non-sexy, non-glamorous ways day after day, mm -hmm. working side by side. Um, David, who formed Harmony, was um, a choir leader at one of the major churches. I guess if you're going to be a choir leader, it's in a church in New York. But at some point in his life, he became disillusioned and he didn't know if this was his path, but he didn't know what to do. So he took some time off to heal and he went to college in Columbus, Ohio with no intention of staying in Columbus. It wasn't cosmopolitan enough. It was gonna be in LA, it was gonna be in New York. And then he ended up working on Obama and some other campaigns. And he realized that I've been too small minded. If I want a really diverse community, then I have to open to these people if I want them to open to me. So there's, and, and if I'm kind of skipping around and you want clear, if you have some questions, let me know. So there's the 500 member choir, there's a band. There's also choirs that began in prisons. The woman's uh, correctional facility. And Ronnie, who's in the book, is a warden who welcomed David into the prison, thinking, I'm either going to help these women or get, David's going to get me fired, you know? Mm -hmm. And they chose a program where women could actually, where women were he, um, healing from addictions. And that's where they formed the choir. And here is where women could actually not be in separate cells. Um, so there is the choir in a cor correctional facility. And while I was watching the spring concert, they came out as a special guest. Um, the correctional facilities gives these women permission to come out for a night and sing. And they came out to me looking kind of terrified. It's a huge audience holding hands. And there wasn't a dry eye in the house, not because, and, th and this is an important part of community, not because, wow, look at these women who isn't this moving, they came out of prison and it's inspiring. It was because in that moment, there was no barrier between us. There was no difference. That's what community does. Right. No, I think that really comes through in the book. One of the things that I take as the theme is that is the is that, that hunger and yearning for that 
And yet there's all the social cultural reasons why it's so hard and systemic more than anything else, the kind of structural and systemic reasons yeah. why people are segregated, positioned against each other, stratified against one another. And yet your book speaks to the hunger to move beyond that and pointing to some ways to actually practice, create those practices of breaking through. And, and in, listening, in listening to you speaking to the themes that I was reading about, and I noticed how energized you are, right, in the telling, in the retelling. And, you know, I'm, I'm an expressive arts therapist and a drama therapist, and like <laughs> I can feel it in my body. And um, the, the act of storytelling is so important. Yes, the book is telling that and how I'm hungering, how we're all hungering for some, for these kinds of stories, the yes stories in the face of the overwhelming threats that keep coming in and keep wiring our brains towards threat. You know, yeah. as mammals, we're wired towards threat and uh, the news keeps get pulling us in that direction and your book is pulling us, no, hang on, there are, this is happening all the time. It's happening and we don't know about it and that your book is giving that space. Oof. Um, so yeah, we get, I, I want, I've got a lot of other questions that are coming out of this and um, here's, here's one of them. Community building, you're talking about community building and you mentioned, especially across differences um, and that it's difficult work um, and working across differences in particularly in the United States with its deep history of segregation and its lack of naming of, of social class, actually, you know, the sort of idea that if you're poor, it's your own fault is so deeply embedded. Um, and yet the stories that of the um, communities that you were uh, working with are explicitly working against the grain, it seemed like, um, more than the word inclusion, which can feel very, and, and you talk about this in the book, this isn't about inviting folks in, this is about starting with the assumption that we are a community. How do we become the we? How do we be the we that we are? And I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that, to that, well, how does that happen? Well, you just spoke, I think, to the, the spiritual component. It is like, this is, we do belong. We belong everywhere. Even if there's places in the world because of the othering that aren't meant for me to be in in this moment in time for safety or whatever, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that I don't belong everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so does everybody. Mm -hmm. And so does everybody. That is our inherent condition, but we have so many layers. So while we talk about inclusion, it's sometimes the most obvious ways people think about, but damn, like if we can't surface our differences where we all kind of have similar experiences, how in God's name are we gonna attract people who look different or have very different life experiences, right? So we have to get over this habit of mind that excludes us. I talk about, and I, I'm still, every time I say this, I'm slightly embarrassed. So Uta is my friend who I met at Community First Village, and she was chronically home. I say homeless because I think of home as much greater than just, yes, people need houses first and foremost, for sure. Um, but in my head, when people said, who's Uta? Like, cause I would be Uta this and Uta that. I was excited after I meet these folks. And in my head, even though I wouldn't say it, it would be like some thought bubble that was Uta who had been homeless for 10 years. Why do we do that to some people? Why did I do that? You know, it's like, we're so conditioned that what is the norm, whatever that means is not named and everything else becomes the, you know, how we characterize somebody, the mm -hmm. person that was one home was once homeless. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if like, mm -hmm. you were like, oh, my friend Shoshana, who has an, had an anxiety disorder, who was out of work for six months. Can you imagine if that would be what? But as you're saying that, I'm thinking that is the training, the conventional training of a therapist and why I stopped wanting to be a therapist. Because particularly in the US where it's diagnosis first, it's diagnosis that's gonna open the door to treatment. To, to you know reimbursement etc that yes. that's a deeply ingrained habit of mind that's yes. trained into therapists right and it, again thinking wow the the gift of this book is is opening that space up and saying no this is about person first right like 
forget right. these names like how do we bring how do we come together as as human beings with common common needs common basic needs actually that that and fear that, is like, just is like a deep thing right like you're suffering how do i help you i have these techniques for something that's called anxiety okay mm -hmm. but even even analytic you know because i was trained before you know, early on psychoanalytic, psychodynamic, I can't tell you how, you know, there'd be these camps of, you know, the theory was six months or three years of what was, and they would say, you know, 44 year old woman who has two children, and then they'd be off to the races and theory. And I had no idea who this human being was. Right. So there's a way that we're so attached to our narratives, man, as opposed to Tell me about yourself in this moment. Now, having said this, people who are othered and wounded also wear that those identities that are damaging because that's what they've been told or that's why they've been excluded. So there is healing that needs to take place in communities of very vulnerable people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is like a, a, a such an important conversation thinking about um, also, another effect of the of COVID nineteen and the pandemic has been the fact the crisis for healthcare workers, for nurses, for doctors, for therapists, who ourselves themselves we're, we're all humans, right? Folks have lost family members, the vicarious traumatization, the um, the ways in which healthcare workers are now being maligned. This is not an us and them. This is all of us. Thank in you. different all of us we all are of all races we are all of all backgrounds and um, I mean again I'm wondering like the power of uh, what the power is of writing a book like this right now to speak to breaking down these artificial barriers between us and them in in clinical in so-called clinical roles like coming out from behind the, the mask in some ways in yes. you know in bringing our own vulnerability out in challenging this the hierarchy of, of the therapeutic relationship in a sense yeah hierarchies expert models mm -hmm. i mean yes you do need to be accompanied mm -hmm. with someone that knows a bit about accompanying for these things right. um, how, do, how do i accompany you but you're at the center of this journey and i'm here with you but i am not here as the expert knowing where you're going I am beside you. Right. Yeah. And how about like clinicians? It's one thing in, you know, private practice, but how about in hospital settings where clinicians aren't even given time to have a human relationship? Right. And so that's why I hope if the, the take home of the book is it doesn't have to be time consuming. It could be like you welcomed me. And I'm going to come to California because I want to see you in person. By the way, I did after some of the people I met because I wanted to get more kinds of communities it happened after COVID, mm -hmm. but I then traveled to Austin and it felt like I already knew them, but it was so important to get a hug and, you know, mm -hmm. um, but so it's, it, it might be okay. We're ha we have to do our business, but we can take two minutes. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have a family member that they mm -hmm. want to or does any just two minutes mm -hmm. or even if you're you're so frustrated at a healthcare system that's not that's treating you as like just symptoms for someone to recognize that mm -hmm. and to see you so it's like how do we begin to practice this in the time we have in the settings we have right. i love that yeah i was doing so i've been doing some work with um a, a regional health uh organization and we we did there's a group there's folks who are using narrative medicine um mm. and so i'm working with been working with some doctors who are doing narrative medicine in their training and i was working with the doctors who are using narrative medicine and we had a, a one day kind of retreat for them which was so moving um for me and the one of the biggest issues that was on their agenda was what they call in in the field moral in, in moral injury the, the feeling that they can't possibly care for the needs for all these folks um, is completely impossible. And the moral injury that they feel as, 
as healthcare workers that they've perpetuated what space is there. So we, we've been using arts-based approaches to help them be able to tell these almost unbearable stories um, is, of is what that, they're dealing with. Is that the narrative medicine, them telling their own stories? The narrative medicine is, we use poetry. Narrative medicine uses poetry a lot and, and um, prose to mm. sort of read a poem that might be a way for them to start making connections with their own stories and be able to write and share from that so that they're not re-traumatized by the whole process. Um, but again, it, it's very much within these practices of belonging that, that they need to be together to share those stories. They're not appropriate, of course, to share with their clients, but in order to keep rehumanizing themselves from a dehumanizing system, how can we create communities where they where they can belong and be real and tell their truth? Yes. Um, yeah. And and maybe where you can share it. So if, if a client comes yes. in, I'm thinking of an older client, family member of mine, who told the same story and no one listened, mm -hmm. even though there were severe symptoms. It is, it would be appropriate when someone finally listened to her and say, I know I get frustrated too. People can't be listened to the first time they walk through the doors, you know? Yeah. Because how many people want to step outside? We know we're working in broken systems, but it's like, right. where do we go? It's That's why this book is how do we begin to infuse these qualities into broken systems? Right. To make them more connected. Yes. That's where transformation happens. So in that brings me to another question. <laughs> I really wanted to get to <laughs> all of these questions I wanted to get to, but something about, you know, this could be an overwhelm. This is overwhelming on some level, right? There are these traits. How the hell do we even begin to practice them? Well, what did you learn about, about leadership? Like what, what did you learn about the folks that were the instigators who, who were like on fire to make things happen? What were the traits of what are the leadership, I don't want to say the leaders, what are the leadership traits? What are the traits in communities that, that allow for these, for, for these six traits to come through? Well, there are leaders and that could look different ways, but leadership in a community is yeah. not hierarchical and, and things are imperfect and, you know, but um, I had a conversation with Parker Palmer who writes on community and I am sure I am botching his metaphor, but here it goes. He talked about, you know, leadership in a community is almost like an orchestra. That's which I think was so fitting to harmony. It's, you know, you basically give some ground rules or like good teaching. I'm going to say good teaching. You give some ground rules and then you let people have at it. There is no hierarchical leadership or it's like uh, indigenous circles. My friend, Vince Two Eagles, who is in one of the chapters on holding tension, he said that in, uh, you know, the word Indian chief is not used, you know, what is, what really happens is it could be an auntie that selects someone to be a leader in the circle for a particular time. Mm -hmm. And then when that problem is done, they come to the circle again. And now having said that, because uh, reservations sometimes have been infused by capitalism, there is hierarchies in cultures, but traditional ways are the circle. And so leadership is very different. It's messy, it's not convenient, but if you really want change to surface the gifts of everybody, that's going to be the game changer. It is not going to come out of the person we elect to save the day. It's not. It's going to come from our skills at not only surfacing differences, but our capacity to have eyes to see what we miss in our ableistic culture. You know, especially I wrote a chapter on people with cognitive disabilities, and sometimes people might see that that's so sweet. It's beyond sweet. It's Everybody has gifts. And what we realize, and I get emotional when I think of this, is when you are in community, it's not like, wow, what a, I'm going to remember this story, but it's more like, 
How could I have missed this? How could I have not seen this beauty? And this is someone who thinks that I am open, but I, you, this is where grieving comes in. When we're in community, we're gonna grieve at how much time has been missed. What we miss by just including some people to the party. Mm -hmm. And even if you, we come from places where we think, oh, you know, we're in an organization that seems more open and we still only include so many people to the party, you know? I'm really, I, I'm, I'm sort of struck by that word grief. And I, I've been thinking, I was just thinking about it this week. And actually, I think after I I told you before, before we started that I, I had been at this the Mount Madonna uh, overnight retreat at this um, beautiful retreat center, and um, I was talking to some folks there about um, about about living there. And I was talking to this one woman, and she said she just came back after thirty years. Um, she had grown up there as a kid, and several of them had, and that. It's a beautiful spiritual community that embodies many of these traits that you're talking about. And I thought, well, this is very synchronous. And I said, well, what brought her back? And she said, well, what's brought many of us back is um, the grief um, of all the losses since the since the you know COVID nineteen and the pandemic and the desire and the way it's impacted the community here and our desire to come back and be of service and bring our skills home, mm. bringing our skills home and thinking about the larger again culture of the united states is the dominant culture of what what happened to the grief what happened to the grieving of these thousands and thousands of humans who have passed over the last few years from this from this terrible disease it's like we have where's where's the grief expressed yeah well i wonder how much will be delayed but if we don't have communities to grieve and also communities where you can grieve. I lived in Africa for a bit and a, a, a friend died while I was there and the community were writhing and yelling in a way that was so disconcerting to me. Um, but I realized like they knew how to grieve in their bodies and in their song, you know? I think also our defensiveness about the grief of, and it's not, it's our culture, but it's, it's all countries that bought into enlightenment to recognize we're not enlightened because it was on the backs of people that we have caused harm, not us personally, but to really own this is not a defensive thing. It's a way of, it's a way of having our lives and our humanity because and people will tell you, people who've been oppressed will tell you, you know, I, I don't want to just say differences, white folks, or, but, you know, it comes down to, we, we are harmed too by not experiencing our full humanity. There is so much grief. There's so much grief. And I think, again, you touch on it in the book um, around racism, around ableism in particular, and classism come through very strongly as three unmentionables really in the dominant culture. And yes. how, can, how, can, how, can that, how can we heal without naming them and addressing them yes. directly? But well, I, because of time, because we don't have very much time left and I, I don't, everything's connected. <laughs> but everything's connected. Everything is connected, but I wanted to just jump to one of your, another one of your, um, another one of these six traits, which was around ritual. And because I'm wondering what the relationship might be between ritual, right? Ritual and grief, ritual and naming the losses, ritual and restitution, you know, and yes. making whole, whether there was, whether there's a sense for you of what that might how that can look from your ex from the experiences that you've been gathering and the knowledge you've been gathering. Well, ritual is we we ritualize what matters most. So if you want to see what matters to a, a community, look at the rituals. And I think sometimes I'm I'm going to just say an aside. We we like borrow these rituals or we go to these weekend retreats and do these rituals, but it kind of misses the point. And I don't mean to say that we shouldn't do rituals and weekend retreats, but rituals have meaning because they're practiced again and again within relationship with people. 
Um, and so I do think rituals of grieving are going to be crucial. And even like people who lost, many people like me who've walked away from communities of faith where there was this kind of belonging, but we, I needed to walk away. The kind of ritual, that, that's a loss. And we haven't necessarily replaced that, right? And sometimes we want to borrow other other cultures' rituals, I think sometimes it reflects a lack of faith in our own ability to create them by doing them with sincerity with people we care about and over and over again. Somebody in the book just quickly said, again, I, there's never been a metaphor I haven't botched, but kind of, you know, I'm not even going to say it, but it's kind of like the finger that points to the moon. And someone said, we become so obsessed with the finger that we've missed out on what it points to, you know? Mm. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that. Yeah, I, I, I read that and that really stood out for me. Absolutely. Did I answer yeah. your question on the grief? I think what I'm hearing, what I'm sitting with as you're, as you're talking about that is this sense that we haven't gotten there yet. You know, that it's somehow we're still holding the space and that we're not there. The we, I don't even know who the we is, but somehow as a collect, this collective we, and yeah. it's not just this country, it feels like it's a global thing. I've not really, I don't know, we haven't somehow metabolized it. But what we could do in a small gathering that we decide to call each other community, it's like, tell me what you've lost. Tell me what you've lost and just go around and maybe things will come up mm. that you couldn't imagine. And it's not just the other side of grief is it opens up to the beauty that we miss. The, even in these times that are so, ugh, there's so much beauty. Yeah. And so when we touch grief, it opens us up to everything. You know, it's like someone else in the book said, if you, you know, to do anti-racism racism work, you have to have your heart broken. You have to be willing to have your heart broken. But that makes us tender, you know? It's not about- it's, come, it's coming up to time. And I want to be sure that I have asked you what is the most meaningful question for you. So I wanted to give you the chance to say, is there any question you would, you'd like me to ask you that I haven't yet asked? There's so, any one thing that you really want to be sure to share before we, we are done. <laughs> what I hope the book inspires people to do. Okay. Yes. What would you, what's your hope that this book inspires people to do? My hope is that it inspires them to, to get inspiration from these, but not to have to model after that, to begin to have faith that, that, that even if they get together with three people and start to cultivate, maybe even pick one quality, I'm going to work on this quality this year in the experience of caring for this group. There is no difference between that and a 500 member choir. No difference. It's part of the same river. And it and this is why we don't want to give energy to people who are trying to divide us. But if we keep our finger in the river, we're part of that energy. And it is making a difference. It is making a difference right now. And then lift up your story and tell people about it. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Wonderful to talk to you. I think we have some questions now. All right. Question one from Chris. I belong to a faith community in Berkeley that is small but very diverse. We are a church, a different kind of church. We meet only twice a month in a non-church setting. We are singles, families, disabled folks, LGBT, TQ, social justice activists. Many of our members are people who have been hurt and harmed by other churches and rejected by conservative Christian evangelical groups, especially. How do we become the we feels like the question we need to address. Many of your stories are about our community, are about communities where people live together or close by. Our members come as far as San Jose and Sacramento. 
what might be a good way to connect more deeply with the time we have? Our church service can be anything we want. If we want to build trust, are there things you might recommend we can do together? Wow, that's... Can you just tell me again how often they gather in person? I don't see how often they, belong, they gather in, per okay. in person. So Chris, I think the fact that you gather as you do um, is one of the most unique and beautiful communities because a lot of folks have a hard time gathering with such diversity um, and that kind of inclusion. So one, so even if you meet infrequently, it will make an indelible print. I imagine it does. Um, and you could simply create a short ritual. I don't know what your services are like, but it, uh, one way is that you could surface, um, are, there, are there untapped voices, for example? And you could, I'm, I'm, I'm making this up as I go along, you could practice different kinds of leadership because sometimes the quietest voices that don't seem like they'd be the leader are people who step up and add something that the group really needs. So one question you can just have before people meet is, why don't you write down some things um, that maybe we're not bringing to the group? Um, I think you're talking about how to bring the week. Oh, they meet tw only twice a month, sorry, in a non-church yeah. setting. I think twice a month, to be honest. I, I'm telling you, twice a month can be a powerful way to meet. There was only one intentional community here. The choir doesn't meet that often. Um, no, th and there's another village, but they wouldn't call themselves necessarily intentional community. So it's really, I think what you have is a powerful way. It, I wish I could, you were here and I could ask you more details about it. And the only thing I could suggest is, is anybody longing to do a ritual? My guess is that you could create rituals that are as powerful as any 2200 year old church um you know one other thing is the difference between habit and ritual is like habit is something that we do over and over again to make it easier ritual is not to make it easier it's to elevate it and to make it sacred so i think what you're doing the fact that you're meeting is we don't underestimate that and maybe the next step is to just verbalize um, how you're creating that with each other and ask yeah. each other, you know, because yeah. I'm like, whoa, right. one of the amazingly diverse uh, Dharma centers is in, is in Oakland. So kind of wanting to visit Oakland. <laughs> yeah, definitely <laughs> Oakland, come to Oakland. Yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I'm thinking, wow, the people are coming from as far away as San Jose and Sacramento. They must really, really want to be there. So yeah, building on why they're coming, just to start asking that question. What is it that's bringing you here? Yeah. Why are you, why are you making this commitment? Why do you choose to come here? And how can we, what more do you want from being here? People, you know, consulting them, their own wisdom as to why, bringing, yes. giving a space to their stories. I think that, you know, that's, that's the power of, of the word and, and the power of Lisa's book is bringing those stories out so they can be resources to, to each other. Yeah, take them back to your own communities and share what you're doing as a group. Yeah. You've been talking about this book. I just do a book reading. Tears come to people's eyes and they're starting to think of how do we gather? It's yeah. almost like we need permission. It's like I almost had to write a book to say, will you talk to me about community? Now I keep doing it. Will you talk to me about community? And it's like people still talk to me even though I'm not writing a book on it anymore. We don't give yourself permission to do that. These are the stories that people need to hear. Okay, so um, how do Indigenous healing practices that reiterate community healing integrate with your work? How do they, and I'm wondering if that's like, how does it show up in, if you could speak to how it showed up in the uh, communities that you, you were working with or visiting. And also my work, you know, and the reason I'm saying this is, I, I have learned about community over the course of the past three, four years. So it's more, I'm just someone deeply committed to continuing to tell stories 
bring these qualities into all of my relationships as opposed to like, I don't work full-time as a clinician anymore. I work part-time, but I certainly use more language of community. Um, it showed up indigenous healing. This person is specifically asking about indigenous healing practices. Indigenous healing. Well, that would be more like circles, How right? So and my understanding is that there's a lot of circle work where they take models after indigenous practices in various ways. And so that, that's not my area of expertise at all. But the, there, were actu there was actually some Dakota, Dakota members of, uh, in, and non-indigenous folks who met in a circle to talk about racism that's in the book. And what's interesting is it's not as if my friend Vince tells me it's not about reconciliation. It's we we call it conciliation because we've never been conciled. <laughs> you know, we've never ever had trust. So they actually learned from uh, Parker Palmer's the circle of trust to learn basic ground rules. You know, no trying to fix people, no interrupting. But what I what I find like indigenous practices, for example, like when I'm just talking to my friend Vince Two Eagles now, you don't interrupt. You listen until someone's done and you have the same done for you. Now, granted, when you have a lot of people, you sometimes maybe have to have time limits, but um, there's something just really beautiful about someone being able to just talk and have the others witness. And I think so many of our conversations and our meetings, even in, play, even in therapy offices are about giving advice or it, as opposed to listening to hear, you know, and in these spaces and in indigenous spaces, the person often comes to the truth themselves. And so questions might just be clarification questions, for example. Does that, that speaks to it? I think that speaks to it. I'm thinking about it. You know, I'm trained as a narrative therapist. And within our narrative tradition, we, had all, uh, we talk about indigenous practices a little bit differently as everyone has indigenous knowing. Thank yes, you. there are indigenous practices that have to do with the land that we're living on. But, you know, most of us are not from. Yeah, yeah. Yet, I think what you were talking to earlier, this sort of the cultural appropriation that can happen because of dominant folks' sense of alienation from their own cultural traditions, which is not an accident. It's not, it's an, it was an intention on the yes. founding of this country to divide people from their roots and to stratify white, white folks, white working class folks against people of color. Wage, David Rodiger's work on wages for whiteness, for example, like really articulates that well and how different, different ethnic groups became white, you know, Italians, Irish, Jews were whitened, you know, so we all have indigenous ways of knowing and um, what, how could we benefit from practices that allow us to, to, to surface those ways of knowing. Exactly. And yeah, I think Parker Parker's Parker Palmer's work is so much about about that too. So, and we all have roots to land. Some of us further away from it, for sure. Right. Um, yeah. Or lands. <laughs> lands. Um, how can we work with our internal fear, anxiety, and humiliation? to find belonging both internally and externally? Thank you, thank you for that question. What you're bringing up, which I didn't address, is I think a central po point. Belonging is belonging in relationship, but it's also a state of mind. And so it's also learning to belong to ourselves. And fear, and shame and painful emotions can get us into defenses so that we create these narratives that get us away from our true nature, including that we belong, we belong, you belong. So, so you know, things like shame and guilt tell us that we don't or that we have to, you know, we have to be better, we have to accomplish this to belong. 
and that's a lie. So I think starting from that place, um, it doesn't mean that they're still not working with shame, but the truth is, is that you belong. And my hope is that, you know, even if we think we don't wear masks, we wear masks as we're in a culture of conditional belonging. But we can over and over again, by, by spending time in commu vibrant communities or creating them, keep walking through the door and getting rid of our masks, shedding our masks. And then we're going to go out in the world of professionals and we're going to put them on again. But the idea is coming back to ourselves again and again. So to get back to your question, see your shame or if it's, if it's your shame, your guilt or whatever your painful feelings are, but know that they don't define you and know that you belong and that we don't have to have a hundred years of therapy to get to this place of belonging because it is our true nature. Thank you. What are some daily practices we can cultivate to take steps towards intentionally building our community? So one thing is, first of all, think about caring. Let's just talk about caring. I go to work. Okay, maybe at work, I'm not willing to tell people I love them. But I can say, how can I approach this person so that he or she or they think that I care? How do I handle myself in a meeting if someone's berating me so I show myself that I care for me? So that's one thing. One other thing is I decided to pick one quality. And the one I picked to work on for a full year, just like in meditation, I'm going to just kind of do this for one year. Hospitality. I think I'm a generous person, but when I think of hospitality, like welcoming people for a meal, I think I, I othered myself. I have friends who can whip up a, a fabulous meal quickly. And I, and I just felt like, oh my gosh, you know, I burn things, I whatever. I had to learn, like, I have enough right now. I don't have to worry about how people are going to get along that come over. Um, I don't have to worry about who's going to show up, but I simply start to invite people. So for example, during COVID, I would find people who would play music and I'd have them come outside and I invite my neighbors and not worry about who was going to show up, not worry about if I had enough food. So for me, it's learning about hospitality, the ancient art of welcoming the guest as if they're family. You pick one that speaks to you, maybe even talk about it in a friend's group. If you get together with a group of friends, there's nothing wrong with having wine and talking about a play. But if you get together and you have conversations about these qualities, your friend group will become more like a community you're gonna start feeling more intimate as a result of that. Thank you. Here's a beautiful, beautiful question. What, what is, I think it means, what is bringing you joy right now in your belonging? Me? I guess. <laughs> oh. And then will you answer that too? Okay. <laughs> so I walk, it's part of my writing and just creative life, I walk five miles a day. And I love conversations, <laughs> but the way that I just get so fed from conversations is I have a lot of quiet. And so um, I travel a lot, so I can't have an animal. I also walk dogs at the Humane Society. So I feel like that restores me because some of the dogs need to have my complete attention so I can't be in my head. So I feel like walking dogs and I feel like walking in nature um, brings me joy. And from that kind of solitude, just now sitting across from you and hearing your question seriously, like talking about community brings me joy mm. because, it, because it gives me hope because I don't know what, I don't know what global warming is going to look like, but I do know that we can keep facing it by fighting each other or we can join. And that's how I want to, that's how I want to do it. And I know I can now. That brings me joy. But Shoshana, how about you? Well, I love the question. This is my kind of a question because I, I really believe that the questions are the most powerful thing we have and that if we ask a good question, we can actually transform everything. And I think the question, what brings you joy is one of those kinds of questions. And particularly when it has the word belonging at the end of it, 
because it points our heads towards the right direction. Like I, I, I went through a, a period of time where I stopped asking people, how are you? Because I felt like it took people into the ne negative narrative or the rote, I'm fine. And instead, right. thought, well, what's a really great question to ask? And it could be, what brings you joy? So I'm having joy right now at the question, the person who asked the question. And in seeing your joyful response brings me more joy. It's like the joy, the question is generative. So what, what uh, that, my experience in the last 24 hours has brought me so much joy. You know, I decided to just do this little overnight retreat thing, you know, a place that's only an hour and a half from here. And everyone was so friendly and welcoming and be just these beautiful souls, people I've never met before. And that brought me joy, a kind of a quiet joy, you know, and feeling that part of me is like, oh, I don't want to be in solitude. But I'm like, no, hang on, this is just lovely. You know, it was just, yeah, yeah. So I, I love that. I love that question. Thanks for asking it, whoever asked it. So thank you for bringing up the nature of the question, because what I didn't articulate is a desire to see that person's face and hear from them because right. it was a very <laughs> tactile question, you know? Yeah. And I have no yeah. doubt that if I got to see her, her, him or they for a moment, I would feel connected because yeah. of the question. Right. Right. Yeah, also it's like, like it's, you have now seen. we're getting excited. I think we're both getting excited and going, we've got lots of <laughs> connections with this question but I think it harks back to that other question about you know how do where do we even start um you know when when um my my or my, the expressive arts therapy program we were building a connection with um a, um a partnership organization in our community and we went the one the opening question we asked to the team was tell us the story about your shoes everyone told a story about the shoes that they were wearing and just like people just like blossomed, right? Like, wasn't, you know, what do you do? And, you know, what's your role? We're like, tell me the story about your shoes. That was how we started our relationship. <laughs> it's like, start somewhere different. <laughs> right? It's like all the way, especially like you said about what question don't you ask? How are you? It's the same like in therapy to say, how are you feeling? We have wrote ways of answering as opposed to yes. what's happening right now. Right what's happening right now yeah um because in feeling then we get these like little thought bubbles of how oh now I have to talk as if I'm insightful <laughs> or something like that right right it's structuring towards a certain goal there's one last question okay and that is what is the difference between intentional communities and collectivistic societies Ooh, good one ah uh, you probably I'm going to respond quickly but then you respond because so intentional communities and I want this book to kind of go way beyond that because I've never lived in an intentional community and I don't feel particularly called to I visit communities for sure intentional communities intentional communities are where people live under one roof or close to each other but the idea that we can be intentional in community we can build like I travel four months a year and yet I can, I used to exclude myself from people who showed up all the time in one place, but I don't need to. I can be nomadic and still be intentional in community. So I would like to just kind of blur the line. And enough, if enough of us bring vibrancy to our relationships and make them communal, then our collectivist inevitably culture will become more communal because we're the ones that are leading the way. That's how it's going to work. No, you, but you well you, you want me to give the formal kind of anthropological definition of a collectivist <laughs> culture yes. <laughs> well cu cultures are defined as generally towards a more individualistic one towards it's really there's really a continuum between individualistic and collectivist but the united states would be like the pinnacle of of individualism founded on the idea that the individual, on rugged individualism, the, the individual is important, individual rights, I have rights. Whereas collectivism, collectivist societies tend to be more um, traditional, um, have longer histories of, of continual belonging with one another and traditions. 
and are characterized by very um, um, relationships of respect and honor towards elders. I mean, there's, there's kinds of characteristics. Japan and China. Yeah. Asian societies often, a lot of, most of the world actually. Right. <laughs> As it so happens, but it's breaking, it's been breaking down um, right. because we become so much more of a global society, but it's a very different, it's completely, the, it, intentional community and collectivist communities are completely different. But um, and one other piece is that even though we are very individualistic in our DNA in this country, we also gathered more collectively. I, I spoke with a woman from Germany and she said, because we have such a safety net, I find that people in America bring the, you know, the metaphorical and literal casseroles more. It's so, so it's, true. It was one of my questions I was going to ask you, but I didn't have time. We, could get <laughs> we got a couple of minutes. It was what values, norms, practice, God, I sound like a sociologist. What values, norms, practices, and cultural influences do you think enabled these specific communities to go against rugged individualism? I think I'm going to push back. I know there's rugged individualism, but I think we also want to connect. And I also think I just dis distinguish an important distinction is individualism versus individuality. And the, the communities of old that didn't allow us to be authentically who we were, now we need to bring our individuality to the collective. And it's not that we don't want to, even though sometimes we look for like fabulous experiences as opposed to be here and this is what it is, this is where the gem is, you know? But so I lost my train of thought, but individuality is what we need to bring to collective experiences. There's so the both and, thank I'm hearing you. you say there's a both and about this. It's the honor and respect for community values, common values maybe. Right. shared values while respect for for each individual and their right to be as as they are Authentic. right but, but, but that's not it because individualism also almost deifies competition and it's yeah. not that we need to get competition out the window but we need to learn to collaborate and mm -hmm. to prioritize that over well, we have one more minute left okay <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder if we want to just have like a minute of some kind of a little closing ritual of some kind because ritual has definitely been invoked here I want to just see if people want to close their eyes and I could just give a couple words yes so if we, if we just close our eyes and in a minute of clock time can be all of the intentional space that we need to imagine our capacity to hold each other, all of us who are listening, all of us who are being present and have showed up because they cared about community. And if we can imagine ourselves connected And then to take this one more step, all of us who are listening because we care about community are holding up all the people, the kin, the people we care about, biological, emotional, psychological kin. And we could almost imagine extending that out. And as we build vibrant community, we will create these circles of care I want to be quiet just for a few moments as we all honor that we showed up today. And we are the people capable of creating the energy that will transform us into a collective loving culture, staying right here. Thank you. Thank you so much.